we're continuing with our series, our second week, and it's something, it's called Freedom. And Jesus has come to give us freedom. That's why he came on the planet, by the way. He came to save us and to give us freedom. Freedom from destruction. Freedom from a life that means nothing. And freedom from an eternity without him. And so Christ has come to give us freedom. That's part of the vision of Cornerstone Church. And one of the things at Cornerstone Church, we have a vision. Our vision is to help people to come know Christ to find freedom, to discover their purpose, and to make a difference in the world. That's real simple what we're called to do. And today we're talking about freedom, and this is the second week of our study. And we choose to do it in January because January is a great time for new beginnings. Uh, according to what I've read, a 90% of our society gets involved with some kind of resolution or a new thing in January. Uh, we find gym memberships are way up. They have to bring new equipment in. And by the middle of January, they take it back out again, and you don't have to wait in line for the treadmill anymore. So uh, people do that. They start new diets. They said, then this year, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be angry anymore. This year, I'm going to uh, do this or do the other. And a lot of people make all sorts of resolutions uh, this year, I, I'm going to be more positive. This year, I'm going to spend more time with my children. This year, I'm going to read the Bible, uh, the whole thing through. And by the, the second week, you're so far behind, you get discouraged. And I want to encourage you, for those that are reading the Bible, if you've missed a day, so what? Pick up where you left off and read. Let me tell you, you do that every day. And then when you have an extra day, go back and read what you missed. But don't let that stop you. Just continue to do that as we're doing that as a church. But that's what happens. And many people make New Year's resolutions, and by the middle of January, many of us, including myself, we have found ourselves not meeting what we've hoped we would have done. And if, you, if you've been trying to change one particular aspect of your life and constantly bang into not having success, it gets frustrating. You're like, you know what? Let's just not do any more resolutions. I make a resolution not to do a resolution, but the fact is you just made a resolution because you made a resolution not to make a resolution. So no matter what you do, you make resolutions. And so January is a natural time. And so at Cornerstone, what we try to do is, is uh, help our learning through the Bible. We try to go with the seasons of life that we're going through. So that's why we're dealing with an issues of freedom, where we want to break through from the past. And last week, we spoke about that. And we're in the midst of a 21-day fasting in prayer. Uh, we have these booklets, in case you don't have them. As you leave here today, you'll see them in a little basket. It says, pray first. This will kind of help you to learn how to pray and encouragement and pray. We have these little wristbands that say, pray first. Every morning from 6 a.m. to 7 um, a.m., Monday through Friday, we have a prayer time right here at Cornerstone. We have anywhere from 60 to 100 people participating in a day. Some people are here, some people are online. Some people do it at 6 a.m., some people do it during a day. And even my parents in Florida, they're watching it too. I want to give a big shout out to my parents in Florida. They're suffering for Jesus in 80 degree temperatures. And so, uh, so I'm going to say to hell to them. I always want to do that when I'm on TV. I'm not on TV, but say, hey, mom. But uh, it's so good to see mom and dad that they're watching with us too. It's really neat that we could do that. And for those of you that are not feeling well or are sick or at home, I welcome you to those that are watching online or watch later on as well. So really what it's all about is we're doing this because we want to get closer to God. And 21 days, and we're having fasting. Some people are doing food. Some people are fasting social media, fasting complaining. And that's a good thing to do. And we're just getting closer to God because we want to push forward in God and move um, higher and faster. So that's what we're doing this for. I want to encourage you about that. Well, this series is designed to help us with that one thing. We all have it, right? That one thing we want to get over. That one thing in our lives that seems to trap us. That one thing that seems we trip over, over and over again. Maybe it's two or three things for you, but I think most of us have at least one thing. I thought you were applauding me. That's the rain. Okay. I was like, wow, thank you. Uh, and so we want to deal with that today. Uh, so that we're going to do, and our, and our basic scripture verse today, and our whole series is found in John chapter 8. If you want to run and get there, that'd be great. But this series is about that. Now, Jesus is speaking to the church of his day. He's speaking to people that are believers, that try to follow God, that do the best they can, much like many of us today. And in this verse, we read it last week as well. We're going to read it again because it's going to be something, our, our basic launch pad for the whole series. Now, we'll go ahead and read in verse 31. Then Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, the church of his day, 
If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Let me stop there just for a moment. The Bible says, if you abide. Now, the word abide means to live, to settle down, to actually do. It says, if you abide in my word. It doesn't say if you know my word. It doesn't say if you can quote it or you can spew it off your mouth or you can give a quick quote. He's saying, if you abide, if you live in my word. If you subject yourself, if you live by my word, you are truly my disciples, which means followers of Christ. So many times in our society today, we think just because we can recite something or we can um, give it verbatim, we know it. You don't know something until you live it. In fact, I would say to you today, I, I, I know this water. I, I believe in it. I believe it's a water. I believe it's from Costco. Kirkland, and I believe it's a small little bottle because when we buy the big bottles, the kids drink half of it, and it gets wasted. So we buy these small ones. But for me, I, drink, I, I can drink one in one moment. But I believe it's a bottle of water. I, I believe there's water in it, but I don't know it, and I don't abide in it until I drink it. That's called a segue. So um, that's how you, I know it now because I drank it. I ingest it. It became a part of me. And so what the bo- word says here, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples. And you shall know the truth. And the word know is gnosko, which means to know intimately, like drinking this water. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Doesn't say might, it says will make you free. And then they answered to him, hey, listen, uh, we're Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. Hey, listen, I've been going to church for many years. I've been on the deacon board. Uh, I've been on the board of directors of uh, many churches all growing up. I, I, I've done kids, kids' church. I, I've even written a couple commentaries, and I've traveled around the world and did all these things. It doesn't say about that, does it? What does it say? It says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But we're Abraham's descendants. We've been in church all of our lives. How can you say you'll be made free? How can you say, I'm a Christian and there's no bondage in my life. Jesus paid it all on the cross and I got no issues in my life or nothing. I'm free. I'm fine. There's nothing to worry about. This is what they were saying. What are you talking about? I'm in bondage. We're not in bondage. It's those Gentiles. It's those other tax collectors. Those are the ones, the people outside the church. It's that political party. It's this person. Those are the ones. You say, Jesus says, no. He says, how can you say we be made free? And Jesus answered them and said the following, like he said to us today. Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. How many of you have areas of your life, you know you're not supposed to have this kind of attitude, you know you're not supposed to smoke this or drink this or do this or uh, flirt with this or click on this or be involved with this. You know you're not supposed to do it, but you just can't seem to kick it. You know you're not supposed to lose your temper. You know you're not supposed to uh, do these various things, but you know you just can't seem to control yourself. Well, my friends, that's called slavery. And make no mistake, if we were perfect, we wouldn't be slaves. Now, let me, we'll explain this in a few moments in greater detail so you don't think I'm saying you're slaves, but the truth of the matter is sin has a mastery over us. If it didn't, we'd be Jesus, and we're not. You and I are all working, or hopefully you're working on areas. And so the church of his day was saying, hey, we've never been in bondage to anyone. So whoever commits a sin is, is sin and a slave. Verse 35, and a slave does not abide in the house forever but a son abides forever. And so that has many different connotations, but one of the connotations is you're not experiencing the sonship or daughtership. You could because you're in bondage to it. God has so much greater things for you and I to experience. He really, really does. And then he says this, therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. If the son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. In other words, you will be free. And indeed, you will be. Uh, You will be free. He doesn't say you might be. He says you will be free. Jesus says, if the Son. Now, the question is if. And there's an if clause, which means there has to be a participation on our end uh, to a certain level, a certain thing. So let's go ahead and and, uh, go forward. And our basic premise today is simply this. Applying God's truth brings freedom. Applying God's truth brings freedom. And this is the beautiful part of it. If you go to the doctor, let's suppose you're struggling with uh, uh, high blood pressure. He says, I want you to take this medication. I want you to take it every single day before meals. Uh, you got to do it. Now, if you take that medication, you don't have to sit there and go, okay, 
Blood pressure, go down. Blood pressure, go down. Blood pressure, go down. What are you doing? I'm getting my blood pressure down. That will make your blood pressure go up. Okay, but you submit yourself to the medication, right? And as you do that, the medication does its work. When we submit ourselves to God's word, the Bible says, my word does not return to me without results, without, without void. And so when you apply God's word, you just apply it. You just, you just do what it says. The word will take care of the other part. What God's asking us to do is to apply it. And so applying God's truth brings freedom. Now, Galatians talks about this battle that you and I have, and this is what it says. For the desires of the flesh, and when it says flesh, it means the stuff you don't want to do. It's the old nature. It's that nature that you see in a nursery. Mine! You know, you know what I'm talking about? You know, that little child, that you, know, you go to a nursery, there's this old nature. It's all about me! You know, and it just, it just screams, and it's, it's mine! And we grow up with that same thing. It's mine! How dare you? You know, and, and we get upset all the time. If someone doesn't give us respect, if we don't get the, the accolades we want to get, if we don't, people don't treat us the way we want to treat, we get like a little baby. Mine! Well, that's the old nature. That's the undisciplined, sinful nature. And the Bible says, for the desires of the flesh, the old nature... <clears throat> are against the spirit of God in us. There's a battle going on. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to one another to keep you from doing the things you want to do. You know what I'm talking about? I'll never again drink again like that. I'll never get drunk again. I'll never blow up at my kids. I'll never uh, let peer pressure get me. I'll never do that again. I, I, I'm not going to be negative anymore. I'm not, you say all these things and it happens again. It keeps you from doing the things you want to do. And last week we talked about that. One of the ways to, to kind of give you a little hyperdrive, if you will, in your spiritual life is to take these 21 days and say, I'm going to focus on this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray, which connects us to God, and I'm going to fast, which disconnects us from the flesh. I'm going to work on these two things. And you know what? I love the fact that the Bible is so honest and so true. A lot of people say, I don't like church because it's full of hypocrites. And you know what? You're absolutely correct. The church is full of hypocrites, and I'm one of them sometimes. And you know what? I have a funny suspicion. You are too. And the beautiful thing is this. Thank you. Are you okay? I'll call the ushers to give you some uh, CPR. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the truth of the matter is we're all hypocrites. And you know what's so wonderful about the Bible? It tells it like it is. If you read from Genesis to Revelation, almost every person in the Bible has said one thing and lived another way. And at times, we're hypocrites. But the truth is, God works with hypocrites. That's why he died on the cross. So yes, the church is full of hypocrites. If it wasn't, we wouldn't have to have a church. We'd be perfect. So this is not a perfect church. We're not perfect people. We are on a mission to be subjected and, and free in God. And so the Bible talks about that. And, and when it talks about you oppose instead of doing the, very th do the thing you want to do, and the apostle Paul struggles with this. This is a guy that is the uh, who's who in the church. I mean, he wrote a third of the New Testament. He was Ivy educated, really uh, wonderfully educated on Gamaliel. He was a tremendous man of God. And know what he says? I love what he says in Romans 7, 15. It gives me hope. He says the following. I don't understand myself at all. How many of you have ever been there? I don't, I don't get it. What's the deal, man? Why do I keep doing this? I said this is the last time, God. God, this is the last time. I'm not going to do this again. I swear I won't do this again. God, forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, God. I would not, I would not. I'm not going to lose my cool. I'm not going to lose my cool. And someone cuts you off and you lose your cool. Or I, I, I'm going to stop. I'm not going to stop. And you say, you know what? Probably a most a dramatic way of looking at that is maybe a, a heroin addict or a drug addict. Someone like Daryl Storberg who now is free and he's, he didn't want to do it anymore. He was addicted to crack, and he would go on the street and be gone for weeks and weeks and weeks, and he struggled. He didn't want to do it anymore. He hated his life. He kind of gave up for a period of time. I actually heard him do his testimony about that. And that's a dramatic thing. Maybe you're not on crack. Maybe you're not on heroin. But we all got these addictions that control us. And God wants us to be free. You don't have to live with that conscience behind you. They're messing up. I don't understand myself at all, the Apostle Paul says. For what I really want to do, it is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do the very thing I hate. I said I would not do it, and I did it. I did it again. 
And I don't want to do this anymore. I'm sick of this. God, I'm so sick of it. Well, forgive me, God. Forgive me, God. Forgive me, God. Then you feel bad. You're like, forget it. I'm not, God doesn't want to talk to me. So you feel down in the dumps, and guess what happens? You do it again. And now it's easier to do it. And you do it over and over and over. And you're like, you know what? This is the way I am. The struggle is very real. Chapter 8 talks about the solution for that. But there's a progression of frustration that happens. I think all of us can relate to this. This is what happens. The area we struggle with becomes part of our identity. I'm going to use, I'm going to use the example of, um, of smoking. I'm not picking on smokers, okay, but or drink, drinking and smoking and gambling, okay? Let's suppose I'm struggling with gambling. I just can't help myself. When I see that Powerball, I've got to do... Okay. By the way, if you win, give it all to the church. <laughs> And we'll give it right to the Lord. The error we struggle with becomes a part of our identity. And one of the things they teach you to do at AA, which I appreciate, they teach you to take responsibility for your actions. And that's something that's anti-culture. Right now, we blame everybody else. It's their fault. They say, listen, my name is Eric, and I'm an alcoholic. And that's good that you say that. But the problem is your identity now is wrapped up with you being an alcoholic. So now your identity is your vice. Well, I haven't done it for 20 years, but I'm not an alcoholic. And yes, it's good to take responsibility. That's good. But what we often do, it becomes part of our identity. I'm a smoker. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a worry ward. I, I struggle with women. I struggle being pure. I, I struggle not clicking and, doing, and flirting. I, I just can't control myself. And, and what happens is you find yourself, it becomes a part of your identity. And then what happens is you get a sense of hopelessness. This is just the way I'm going to be. I can't control myself in this area. I can't control. When I see Captain Crunch, I cannot control myself. <laughs> That's why we don't have it in the house. Okay. I just confessed. Peanut butter, Captain Crunch. Okay. If you give it into it, you can become hopeless. And then what the next step is? The next step is you become defensive. Now, it becomes part of your identity. You feel hopeless about it. Now, don't you dare say I got a problem with it. You know, I, I think you're doing a little too much drinking. What are you talking about? Uh, there was a series, uh, there was a situation, a dear friend of our family, a number of years ago, this gentleman was, uh, was, was addicted to, to um, crack, cocaine, drinking. He's a great guy. We loved him. But he kept doing it over and over again. He started getting defensive. Don't tell me I don't have a drinking problem. I can control myself. And he got all upset. So we had to do something about it. We need to do an intervention. So we literally had an intervention in this church. So we invited his family, his friends, people that loved him and cared about him, and we all came together, and we confronted him with it, and he appreciated it, and he made a change. He slipped up one more time, and he got serious with God, and he's free today, living a good life. His family's doing well. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. I love stories like that. But what happened was he had to come into, uh, he, had, he had to take ownership of it. And he was very defensive. Are there areas of your life someone's going to say, don't talk to him about that. Don't talk to him about being a negative. Don't talk about flirting. Don't talk about that. Don't talk about gambling around this person. No, no, no. McDonald's Monopoly is fine. They say, <laughs> you know, uh, NyQuil's fine. And, and they get this way. And, and they, get, they get to this point where they feel defensive about it. And you cannot talk to them about this issue or else you are in trouble. That's what happens. You know what the next thing is? It becomes part of your identity. You feel horrible about it. You're defensive about it. And then what happens? You become a slave to it. Now it controls you. You have no control. The moment it knocks on your door, you give in. Drink this. <laughs> give in to this lust. Give in to whatever it is. Whatever it is. Give in to the worry. Whatever it is. And you give in to it right off the bat. And you feel like a slave. And you know what happens after that? You begin to lose your life. You get this nagging thing in your life. Oh, I wish I could get over this. But don't you tell, dare, dare tell me I have a problem. And your life and your family gets affected. Your relationship gets affected. Your workplace gets affected. Now it starts interfering with your life that God has given you. Well, today we want to change that progression. Today we want to stop the madness. We want to stop this horrible progression. We want what is a way to turn it around God's way? How do we stop that one thing? Or are we just damned for that thing? I'm sorry to use such strong language, but that's how you feel sometimes, don't you? I know I have. But we need to apply some truth here. Applying God's truth brings freedom. And the first thing I want to mention to you today is this. Number one is this. 60 
59% of the Christian church today, evangelicals, do not believe in a devil. The first thing I want to say to you today is there are demons. And no, it's not your spouse. There are demons. There really are. And it's not the demons we see on television. It's not the demons we hear in movies. It's not all that. There are demons. There are. There are fallen angels that are out. There is an enemy out there to destroy us, to get us the wrong way. You've been in situations where there's such evil, you can sense it and feel it. There are demons. Oh, come on, Pastor. Give me a break. Come on. You, get out of it, bro. You're, you're, you're really... You're delusional about this. You guys are a little nuts. You, you blame the devil's only a symbol. It's not really true. My friends, it's true. There is a devil out there. He may not bother with me. He's got better things to do, like world leaders. But he does have demons. And not the, I, I, can't, I was going to say minions, but you're going to say little yellow guys. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> you see, the enemy loves the fact. If the enemy can get you to believe he doesn't exist, then he has a, has a, has a pass in your life. Well, I don't believe in the devil. That's, that's primitive. Well, if you don't believe in the devil, guess what happens? He can have a field day with your life. He can begin to control you and manipulate you to such a degree you're not even aware of it. So that's, that's a victory for the enemy. Or the opposite is you get preoccupied with the devil. You know people like this. They know the devil so well. You know, I mean, they're so afraid of the devil, they don't even have deviled eggs. I mean, they're so... And, you know, if they run out of gas, there's a demon in my gas tank. No, you forgot to fill up your tank of gas. And they blame the devil for everything. And, and you know what? The enemy is, according to C.S. Lewis, and I agree with him on this, the late C.S. Lewis, the enemy's happy if you overdo it or underdo it. Because in both ways, he wins. My friends, the truth is, there is an enemy. There absolutely is an enemy. And then what it says in 1 Peter, it says the following, 1 Peter 5 8 through 9. Be sober minded. In other words, be alert. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. We used, I grew up with cats. I know I joke about cats all the time. I like cats when they're not at my house, but I grew up with cats. And we used to play with a little cat. It used to go like this around the thing, and the cat would go like this. It would go like this. It was really cute. It would get in a little praying motion. I guess we like, my dad liked. Cats because they prayed. But anyhow, so he was praying, and then they looked for an opportunity, and then they jumped forward. If you watch Animal Planet or something like that, you'll see in the Serengeti, you'll see a zebra crossing a stream, and you'll see the tigers or the lions that are sitting there praying, and they're like this, and they're looking, and they're waiting to pounce. And then the moment, the moment, the weakness, when the zebra breaks from the pack and gets a little slow, the, the lion will shoot out and grab it and get a hold of it. The enemy is the same way. He prowls around like a lion looking for somebody to devour. I know that's scary. You may not like hearing that, but my friends, there is a spiritual warfare out there. Um, and I encourage you to go to a previous series called Flourish. I talked about freedom, and I gave a more explanation about demons there. I'm not going to go into it too much here. But it says the following. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Verse 8, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Now, listen to this. This is the good part. Resist him. I just can't help myself. That's true. But in Christ, you can resist. Resist him in your own hard work. Is that what it says? Resist him. No, it says resist him in what? Your Faith in your relationship with Jesus Christ is the answer. It's not self-will only. It's beyond you. It says resist him and firm in your faith, knowing, this is another thing that's encouraging, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. The apostle Paul even said, I don't want to do this and I'm doing it. You're not alone in this. You're not by yourself. You're not the only person here that's struggling. We all are struggling with something. Why don't we just fess up and deal with it? What would happen if, if you tell me what you're struggling with and, I, and I, you know, someone you can trust and we help each other out? Imagine that. Maybe we could overcome a lot better. You see, people are good about talking about angels. Oh, I believe in angels, but I don't believe in demons. Oh, you know, and, and just because something supernatural may not be God, going to a psychic invites demons. Getting involved with tarot cards invites demonic strongholds. Make no mistake about it. So that's the first thing I want to mention today is that we... 
There are really are demons. The second thing I want to mention about this, the, in the reality of what we're living in, is that we can be under their influence. I, I've never been, drugs have never been a problem. Alcohol has never been a problem for me. I don't like to be out of control. But I have to be honest with you, there was a time that I was suffering from allergies. And I took an antihistamine. And I swore I thought I lost my mind. <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about? I thought my mind was in a balloon. And I was ready to check myself in the teen challenge. I got problems. It's just antihistamine. So I hate antihistamines. I don't like being out of control. But the truth is, we can be under their influence. If you, if, for example, if you drink and you get drunk, th does the alcohol own you? No, but you're under the influence. The enemy can influence your life. For example, if you go to the mall and a bad part of an area and you leave your doors unlocked and you leave your purse or your wallet in the front seat with your iPhone and, and all your gadgets, chances are someone's going to come and open the door and steal what's yours. Now, the car is still yours, but they stole it. The enemy can steal what God has intended for us. So there is an enemy, and we do have to deal with him. You, you know, it's not possession, per se. Well, uh, 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 you can't have light and dark in the same place, and uh, you're in Christ, there's no demon possession. Well, I agree with you. There's no demon possession based upon that definition of the word possession. But the, what, the word of God never says possession like the enemy owns you. It means demonized or under subjection or under the attack or under the influence. Make no mistake, there are opportunities that happen. So you can be under the influence. Ephesians 4, 26 says the following. It says, be angry and do not sin. That's a hard one, isn't it? And do not let this, the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Or another version says, a foothold. You and I can give a foothold to the devil. Next week we're going to talk about how to slam the door and put up walls where the devil used to have an access point. That's next week. But for this week, for sure, what we're saying is you can give the enemy access points by what we allow him to do. It says, nor give the place to the devil. Let him who st stole steal no longer. So how do we do that? We need to shut the door on the enemy of our lives. You need to lock the doors, change the locks, and do what you have to do to keep the enemy out. And that's, how does that happen? You have to do that in Jesus' name. So there is a devil. Make no mistake about it. We can be under their influence. The good news is that God is stronger. God is greater. I'm hearing the VeggieTales song, God is greater than the boogeyman. I have little kids. But God is stronger than the enemy. This is not a George Lucas theology. Where there's a disturbance in the forest, there has to be balance. There's a yin and there's a yang. And what we want to do, we need a little bad, we need a little good, but we had a little more good than the bad. We need the bad because without the bad, we wouldn't be who we are. And that gives you your edge. No, that's not about that at all. God is stronger than the enemy completely. Make no mistake about it. There's not, you don't have to fear the enemy with Jesus in, with you. Okay, you don't have to run in fear when Jesus is with you. It says in the Bible in Luke 10, 17, when the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use self-discipline. No, when we use your name. A police officer has power when he puts that uniform on he uses the name of the state. I am an officer. And there's, there's authority and power in the name of Jesus. And Jesus says, look, I've given you the authority over all the power. Of, he didn't say some of the power. He said, all the power I've given you authority over. And you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. He's talking about different types of demonic strongholds. Nothing will injure you. If you're in Christ, don't worry. The, en the enemy cannot beat you or defeat you in Christ. But don't rejoice because evil spirits rejoice to you. Rejoice that your names are written in the book of life. Next week, we're going to explain how to resist the enemy with greater clarity and greater strength. How to shut the door and put them out of business in many areas of your life. But you know what it says in Romans? It says the following. It says in Romans 8, 37, Yet in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, 
nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. My friends, there's nothing stronger than Jesus. You don't have to be afraid of the enemy if you're in Christ. He's bigger, he's stronger. Make no mistake about it then why do I struggle so much? You know, I keep rebuking the devil. This is the problem. A lot of you are trying to cast out the flesh. Uh, Most of our problem is not the enemy, it's the flesh. You can't cast out the flesh, and you can't disciple a demon. So there are times for these various things. But how do I get free? How do I get free? How do I get... Listen, I I don't know about you, but I, I, I get tired of hearing all this stuff. Well, you just need to quote the scripture, you can come to church, read... I know that already, but I'm still struggling. My marriage is still falling apart. I'm still struggling. I can't control myself. I, I'm tired of hearing what I'm supposed to do. My friends, I, I can't do it. Help me out here. Well, I'm glad you asked because you can get help and you can have victory. I'm tired. I want to get through this. What's the secret of it? The secret is knowledge, the knowledge of God. What's the first secret? This is the first secret I want to share with you today. This is, you have to get this in you. My people perish for lack of knowledge. If you don't understand something, you don't utilize it, you miss an opportunity. This is the first thing I want to mention to you today in regards to overcoming is this. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone, look at your neighbor and say, you're an anyone. Boy, that was really enthusiastic. <laughs> say, you're anyone. Thank you. I'm just trying to wake you up. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, and say, if anyone knows about Christ. No, if anyone is in Christ. In other words, they're standing in Christ. They're abiding in Christ. Like right now, you are in the building. You're in, you're on, in or on your seats. Not very grammatically correct, but you're in the building, right? You're in here, okay? If you're in Christ, he or she is a new creation. And, and by the way, the, the, the Greek uh, verb tense in there is a new creation that's constantly creating. It's not like I, I became a Christian. No, it's, it is a process. There's a genesis. There's an evolution of your spirit. I believe in evolution when it comes to becoming like Christ. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have come new. This is a good if you, if you believe I'm a new creation in Christ, I can overcome this because of Christ. Because what Jesus did, in the name of Jesus, I come against this and stay in the truth. I'm gonna say, I want to say something very, very important here. This is a very important statement. If you want to remember this, it's very important. This will help you. Your sin does not define you. Your Savior defines you. Let me say it again. Your sin does not define you. Your Savior defines you. I want you to repeat after me. Your sin does not define you. Your Savior defines you. One more time. Your sin... Wait, hold it. Wait, wait, wait. Your sin does not define you. Your Savior defines you. Again, your sin does not define you. Your Savior defines you. My friends, don't let the enemy steal your identity. Our identity is in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross, not the mistakes you make. That's the good news. The second, thank you. (laughs) The second secret is this. The truth will set you free. That's the secret, my friends. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 4 says this. For though we walk in the flesh, because we do, we're in the flesh, we can't get away from it. We do not war according to the flesh. The problem many times, you and I, we try to solve a spiritual, still spiritual issue with fleshly options. It doesn't work. You solve spiritual issues with spiritual grace and strength. And so how do we do that? It says right here, we, in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4, for we, we walk in the flesh, we do not walk according to the flesh. For our weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in for pulling down the strongholds. Listen, you and I have strongholds. You know what the stronghold is? I looked it up. In the original language is what it means. It's a good definition here. A stronghold, according to the scripture in this context, is this. It is a prisoner locked by 
deception. A stronghold is a prisoner locked by deception. The lock that holds you in that prison cell is fortified and made alive through deception, through lies. Or living by something that's not true. The enemy's greatest strength is not doing all this weird stuff you see in the movies. The enemy's access point comes through something called your mind. That is the gateway. And how he opens your mind and gets in your mind and gets in your soul and your spirit is through the key called lies. He's got this, this key. It's only one key. It's called lies. And this key is like a master key. My friends, God has a key too. It's called truth. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Okay? If the truth sets you free, then what holds you captive? Lies. The enemy is the father of lies. And, and just for to stay safe from time here, you can see in John 8, 44, I'll read a little bit here. He's talking to the Pharisees. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. It does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Lies is his power. If he can get you to believe a lie, he can get in. You're no good. You're on your fourth, you're on your tenth marriage. You're no good. God's done with you. That's not funny. He uses lies to get in there. And this is the scary part, and this is the truth. Psychologists, human behavior, scientists tell us this. This is the truth. This is why Hitler had such a great opportunity. If you can get someone to, if you say something enough times, people will believe it. This is the problem. Your subconscious does not know the difference between truth and false. Your subconscious has no idea what's truth and what's a lie. Your mind may, but your subconscious doesn't. So if the enemy can get your mind to believe a lie, it gets in your subconscious. And your subconscious is your uh, psychiatric <laughs> operating system. It, it, it's what kind of releases the emotions in your head. It, your, your subconscious is the, in, is the mechanism that's running. It's the program of the emotions of your life, and it affects you. So if you believe a lie, that gets in there, and it, it, it deprograms you to the wrong way. Well, how do you get rid of it? I tell you how to get rid of it. You put in the truth, not just truth, but the truth of Jesus Christ, which is stronger than a lie. And so you tell yourself the truth, tell yourself the truth. And what that does is it kicks the enemy out. It, he gets evicted from your life and you fill yourself with the truth. All right. This works, my friends. So what you do is you get the word in. You get faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. You get the truth in your head. You get the truth in your head. And you, yes, you get yourself brainwashed because we're getting brainwashed every day. Fill yourself with the truth. And what happens? The truth gets into your subconscious. And even beyond that, this is even greater, beyond your, your own record of power, then you have the Spirit of God, which comes inside of you, out of your innermost being, where flow rivers. Now you've got the Holy Spirit now working from the inside out, and you're working from the outside in. Total change. My friends, you change, changing how you think by inviting God in your mind and inviting God in your spirit. My friends, it is, a, it is a wonderful combination that will bring freedom to us. The Bible says, I, I wish I could tell you in, in the next 10 minutes how to change everything. I can't. I really can't. But I tell you what it says in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, as we continue to read the same passage of Scripture. It says this, casting down arguments. Now, the word casting is not like, I'm not going to believe that. Casting is violent. I mean, it's, get out of there. I mean, it's grabbing it, and it's going to town. Casting down arguments of every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. My friends, peace through strength. You go after a lie. You hear a lie, don't put up with it. When I hear my kids say, I can't, stop it. I, I, I get irritated when they start saying, I can't, no, you can do it. Stop it right now. I don't want to hear that from you. I, I get really agitated when they start saying junk. Because I don't want that in their head. I just can't. No, you can do it. And I hear that stuff in my mind. I'm not going to put up with it. Because the enemy said, you can't do it. 
You can never get free of the depression. You can never stop doing that. Your marriage is not going to work. No, in the name of Jesus, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. No, I can't do it, devil, but I can do it through Christ. In the name of Jesus, I command this lie to stop right now. I can do all things. And you tell yourself the truth. And you know what you do? You get a baseball bat and you whack the devil in the head. I'm sorry to be so crude. I'm Italian. That's what the mafia does. No, I'm sorry. You give the devil some cement shoes, okay? And you throw him the river of God's promises, and he goes right to the bottom. My friends, you got to deal with it. Don't play with the enemy. Don't play with negative thoughts. If your marriage is struggling, do yourself a favor. Do not hang out with people whose marriages are struggling. Uh, no, I, my, my husband's a jerk. Mine is too. No, get away from those people. My wife, forget it. Get away from those people. Find someone that's been married 30 years, 25 years, 15 years. Find someone that's marriage is doing well and hang out with them because divorce is a communicable disease. If you struggle with smoking and drinking, don't hang out with people who smoke and drink. If you, hang, if you struggle with gamblers, don't go to Foxwoods. I mean, how hard is that? If you struggle with gambling, don't go to the, don't go to the scratch and sniff games. I mean, come on. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And how do we renew? This is, listen, we're getting serious with that. We're not, we're not messing around. We're taking 21 days. I'm going to start this year right. I'm going to fast. I'm going to pray. And some of you need to fast social media. Maybe you need to fast, whatever it is. I don't know what it, you need to fast. Fast something that's holding you back. Pray and connect to God. Make a commitment. I, I can't do it. I, I can't do it in one sermon, but I promise you something. I'll make you a promise. And this is the promise I want to make you. If you will commit yourself to Jesus Christ, number one, give your life to him. You'll commit yourself, if not this church, another church. Come to this church. Don't just come once or twice a year when someone dies or someone gets married or Christmas and Easter. How about you come, instead of coming twice a month, come, every single week you can come. Even if you're watching online, if you can get here, get here. Be around hundreds of other believers. I have good news. That will help you. But I wish I could tell you, this hurts my feelings a little bit. But listen to me speak was not going to change your life. You know what's going to change your life? Getting into the Word every day. Getting into the Word. Start with the New Testament. Get into the Word every day. And then being connected. Get involved with a small group. Get with another person who's going the right direction. Don't hang out with people that are losing in their marriages, losing in their finances, losing with their addictions. Hang out with people that are winning. And then find someone you can help later on. Become a member of the church. Get involved. Get, I, I encourage you. Get involved. Come to church. Get involved in a small group. Read the Bible. Get involved in 21 days. Go ahead and do it. Watch us every day. Get involved and pray. Do that. Keep it going every year. Go to small groups. And then I encourage you to do something else. Get involved with the, with the bud team or dream team at the church. Serve in the church. Find ushers and greeters and get involved. What, what does that have to do? Serve in the nursery. Serve in the parking lot. Serve with the cameras. Serve, with, serve in different areas. Get around other people. Devote yourself. And I guarantee you, give me a year. Just give us a year. Do that for a year. And after 12 months of reading the Bible every day, praying, coming to church, being involved in a small group, serving and helping other people and sharing your faith, if within 12 months, you do not change, you and, I will help, you and I will go and find another church. And I'll leave too. <laughs> I am absolutely, positively convinced more than I'm standing on this stage that if you devote yourself to God first, Jesus Christ, give your life to him. Devote yourself to his body, a local body like this. If it's not this one, you don't like it, go to another church you don't like this one, okay? I'm not the only church. If it's not the only church. But you know what? If you, we're going to go after God together. Get it connected to a small group. Serve in the church. And pray and read. You are going to change. I personally guarantee it. Not only, I'm also the president. No, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not selling hair pieces. It's going to work, folks. It's going to work. Bible says this, be not conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is acceptable and perfect. I'm going to ask if they uh, get ready for our, our communion. Ephesians 4 says this, that you put off concerning your former conduct of the old man, which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed. How do you renew? In the what? In the spirit of the mind. It all comes here, folks. This is the gateway. This is the gateway. Watch what goes in, because what goes in can become sin. 
If it gets here and it gets to here, it's hard to deal with. We defeat the enemy by replacing every lie he's told us with the truth of the word of God. My word will not return void. God's word is truth. He spoke and it happened. Listen, you got errors in your life, you need to tell yourself the truth. And the truth is not some, uh, uh, some do it self-help book. No, we're talking about the word of God. Be renewed in the spirit of the mind. Applying God's truth brings freedom. And I want to have a challenge to you. I gave you a challenge already. Get involved. You can start today with 201. Right now, we're not having any, any freedom groups or any small groups right now because we want to encourage you to pray. But we encourage you. When we open up small groups, start one. If you can't find one, let us know. Put it in the connection card. I want a small group. We'll make one up for you. But I want to talk to you now heart to heart. Can I do that for a few moments? I wonder if they would say something to you. God loves you. God loves you. Let me tell you right now. God loves you and is for you. Some of you need to hear that. Maybe you had a parent that could never please or, or a spouse or whatever. God loves you and is for you. If God wanted to damn you, he wouldn't be alive. Let me say that again. God loves you and he's for you. If he wanted to damn you, you'd be dead in hell. The fact that you're alive, the fact that you're alive, sir, the fact that you're alive, miss, is that God loves you and is for you. I want to read this, this scripture, John 3, 16, 17. I'm reading it from the message. I like how he puts it. This is how much God loves the world. He gave his son, his only one son. Let me tell you something. I, I love this church. I love you people. But I can tell you right now, there's no way I'd give up Luke, Hannah, or Matthew for you. I'm sorry. If that's the case, goodbye. <laughs> there's no way I'm giving my children because I want you to know. I would never do that. But what did God do? He gave himself to Jesus Christ. That's radical, my friends. It's beyond any human love. There's no one that you know that would kill their own child for you. No one. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his only one son. And this is why. So that no need, no one need be destroyed by believing in him. Anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go through all the trouble by sending his son merely to point out an accusing finger telling how bad the world was. He came to help. For God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. And whoever believes in him will not die but have everlasting life. For I did not come to condemn the world. I've come to save the world. Know this. The first thing I want to say is that God loves you and he is for you. It doesn't make a difference what you've done. God is for you. He's for you. The second thing I want to say this. You can be free. You can be free. You don't have to subject yourself to a particular sexual orientation. You don't have to be stuck in, I'm just the way I am. No, you don't. You can be free. You can be free from alcohol and drugs. You can be free from doubt. You can be free from broken and sabotaged relationships. I want you to say out loud, I can be free. One more time, I can be free. You are a new creation in Christ. And I want to read something, one of the most powerful verses in the Bible that actually drives the enemy completely crazy. And this is what it is. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. However, if you're not in Christ Jesus, there is condemnation. There's no protection. But if you're in Christ, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. So you want no condemnation? Stay in Christ or walk according to the Spirit, not the flesh. For the law of the Spirit of life, Christ, has made me free from the law of sin and death. 
That's Paul's answer to his dilemma found in the previous chapter. And I want to repeat it once again. Your sin does not define you. Your Savior defines you. Your sin does not define you. Your Savior defines you. Number one, God is for you. He loves you. He's crazy about you. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. And finally, not only is he, does he love you, he's for you, you can be free, but God also wants you to be restored. You don't have to live a life of shame. You can be restored. Psalm 71, 20 says this. You have shown me great and severe troubles. I'm sorry, you who have shown me great and severe troubles shall revive me again and bring me up again from the depths of the earth. God wants to re resurrect you. God wants to give you grace. God does not just forgive, but he restores. Let's bow your heads, please. We talked about something, and maybe some of you have struggled with it. I know I have areas in my life, too. But I want to encourage you, the only way you're going to overcome this is you have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's, it, it just doesn't work without it, folks. It just does not work without it. And I want to give you an opportunity today to give your life to Jesus. If you have never given your life to Jesus, now's the time. Maybe you've walked away, you've done your own thing for a while, you need to recommit yourself today. I want to encourage you right now. and Say, I want to give my life to Jesus. I'm tired of trying to do it my own way. I'm tired of trying hard. I'm tired of, I'm sick of it. I want to change. I want to give my life to Jesus. With every head bowed, I'm going to say, Pastor, would you please pray for me? I want to give my life to Christ. Real quick, just raise your hand. Just real quick so I can see you. Yes. Anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else today? Come on. Just be honest here this morning. Anyone else say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Christ today. I'm tired of living this way. Okay. Well, let's pray together. A few of you have raised your hand. And for those of you watching live online, God can save you too. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I want you to pray this prayer with your heart. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross and rose again from the dead. Thank you for taking away all my sins. I give you my life today. Wash me and make me new. I thank you that there's no condemnation in you. This day I give my life to you. I declare I am no longer the boss. You are God and I'm not. And I give my life to you. Fill me, Holy Spirit, with your help that I could walk the life for you. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to do something else. In your bulletin, there's a, little, there's a card. It's called a connection card. I've asked you that way to the end. It says right here, it says, I've committed my life to Jesus today. It's also online, by the way. You can click on a connection card. I've committed my life to Christ today or accepted Christ for the first time. I'm going to ask you to be so kind. Could you fill that out so we can give you some materials and help you out? I'm going to ask at this particular point, do we do communion yet? Okay, we want a second. <laughs> but if you could just put that into one of the boxes as you leave or give it to one of the people in the prayer team. Now that we've given our life to Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to eat at this table. Jesus said, this is my body, which has been broken for you. Jesus understands brokenness. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you that you were broken for us, that we could be whole. Take, eat. This is my body, which has been broken for you. After they ate, Jesus took his new covenant of wine. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Until he comes again, remember what he's done on the cross gives us the right to come before him and gives us freedom. Take all you drink. Let's all stand if we could. As we're standing and as the band plays quietly, I'm going to ask the prayer team to make their way up to front. If you've given your life to Jesus today, I encourage you to come forward. You don't have to, but you get to. Now let's pray for the rest of us that are just want to get free of stuff. Let's, let's pray right now. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you that the truth sets us free. And Jesus, we thank you. You are the way, you are the truth, and you're the life. We receive your truth today. Father, we confess 
that we cannot do it by ourselves. Lord, we ask for your grace. We ask for your forgiveness. And we thank you that we can do all things through you who strengthens us. Lord, I thank you that I can do all things. I submit myself to your way, your truth, and your life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you need prayer for anything at all, we want to encourage you to come forward. As the worship team gives one closing song, let's go ahead and do that. Amen. God bless you. May he fill you with his joy, his peace, and his freedom. God bless you. If you need prayer, come forward. Otherwise, we dismiss you. God bless you.